Now, I've often thought, you know, that I was looking backwards through rose-colored glasses. But for good luck, when I was little, I kept a sort of a diary for part of it. And I, and I, I look back at that diary, and it's, the writing's not too good, but it says just what I'm saying now. In those days? In those days. It was good. I knew it was good. <laughs> what were your recollections of the Depression? You were both... Now, Bill, you... listen, you're going to be amazed at what we're going to say. Nothing you say would amaze me. <laughs> well, this is so. The Depression had no adverse influence upon our lives. Our father had work. Were we teaching yeah. him, Amy? We were teaching. We, the pattern of our life was left untouched. Marshall has always prided itself of being a close-knit community where, uh, you know, people were your own kind, I mean, which means middle-class white, and uh, you don't want uh, people coming in and telling you how to run your business. When they sat in at the Woolworth store, some of the young, uninformed young whites, bless their hearts, are stuck lighted cigarettes or threw lighted matches at them and the black youngsters would turn to them and say i love you yeah, current um, black students are not learning much about their past don't know what happened in the 60s somehow we've got to get it back because that's uh, uh, you cannot uh, know where you're going until you know where you've come from i'm bill moyers and those are voices of the 20th century now, this century is the first to have taken moving pictures of itself. And in the weeks to come, we'll use that film to explore some of the extraordinary events of the century and to meet some of the people who made history, generals, tyrants, presidents, and inventors. But history, the historians tell us, is not only what happened, it's what people felt about it when it was happening. Not only in books, diaries, letters, and old records will history be found, but most of all, in memory. So we're going to begin this journey from the ground up as we listen to the people in one small place tell stories of their lives and their town in the 20th century. with Chevron's tradition of service throughout the 20th century. The people of Chevron bring you this program in support of public television. So many of us live in cities today, we often forget that early in the century, America was a nation of small towns. The country town was the place where people met, gossiped, bought, sold, and learned. What happened there shaped public sentiment and gave a character all its own to American culture. So to look at a small town is to open a big chapter of American history. The town we're going to visit this evening is in the northeast corner of Texas, not far from where Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana meet the Lone Star State. It was settled in 1839. By the time Texas seceded from the Union in 1861, it was one of the biggest and wealthiest towns in the state. But then, as sometimes happens, places like Dallas and Houston passed it by. So it's been content all these years with a population numbering between 20 and 25,000. There's no special reason why we chose it, except for one thing. It's my hometown. Now, it could have been your hometown. I'm sure you'll hear echoes of the people you grew up with, feel some of the emotions common to small town experience, and possibly recollect the influences that shaped your own life as mine was shaped in Marshall, Texas. Marshall, Texas. It gave me that small town soul which one writer long ago said makes a man want to know small, unimportant things about the folks that go past on swift journeys. Mark. 
Marshall, Texas honors one of its citizens, Max Leo. I knew Max when we worked together for the local paper, the Marshall News Messenger. He's done a lot of good work for the town, one of those people who stay in a place like this and make a difference, but whose fame spreads no further. I left Marshall 30 years ago for college and other places far away. Every time I come back to see my parents, I'm struck at how the place has changed. This used to be the heart of it, the town square with a bustling courthouse surrounded by small shops. Life's about the same here today as in any town its size. Folks come and go in the sheltered intimacy of the little worlds we all make for ourselves no matter where we live. Nowadays, not as many people come downtown. The Paramount Theater's seen its last picture show. The Lynn Theater doesn't even exist anymore. There's no hotel or restaurant on Main Street to bring folks here. Some shops hang on hoping for a renaissance, but Bell Brothers is gone, a dimmer company, Sam Whitener's coffee shop. All the shops are gone that used to be on this side of the square. Now there's just this drive-in bank. Jesse Carter and old man Key would be spinning in their graves if they knew you could cash your weekly paycheck from the front seat of your car. When they were running the banks, you could hardly change a dollar bill for four quarters without their endorsement. This was all woods, or open space, meadows. Now it's shopping centers. When the first shopping center came to the outskirts of Marshall, the heart of the city, its downtown area, the square, which had been its life for a hundred years, began slowly to ebb away. We used to, right here used to be a tiny grill, where for 25 cents you could get the best hamburger in America, it's run by Mr. Pokinghorn. Only six people could get in there at once, six people. Now there's McDonald's, Bonanza, Burger King. Who cares that, you know, the sign there says 40 billion McDonald's sold. They weren't sold in Marshall. Some things don't change. The passions of Friday night football. Pep rallies, bonfires, great expectations of glory and conquest. It was bigger than Christmas. I was part of it. During the games, I was a cheerleader. Right before halftime, I'd dash under the stands to trade my pep squad silks for the uniform of the marching band. And I'd blow like Gabriel on the trumpet my parents had saved for months to help me buy for $35. We usually lost to our arch rivals, the Longview Lobos. That hasn't changed. Sundays are still much the same as they always were. My father says there are more Baptists around here than people. Of course, God has other children too. It takes all kinds and we have them here. Methodists worship in a church built by slaves. It was started in 1839 with hand-molded bricks and hand-hewn beams and a gallery in the balcony for the slaves. The piety could stifle a teenager's fancy and it didn't always leave much room for new ideas to spring forth in town. But the old story assigned a plot to the universe and told us our role in it. If a lot of us are between stories these days, the old story still means something here. I've got a string that none of y'all can break. What do y'all think about that? Oh, 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 all right, walk out with that one. Back up, oh, all right, everybody get a hold. Now, can you break it? Nobody can break it. All right, now, sit down, sit down, wait just a minute now. If we're holding on to God, and if we're loving God, and if we're letting him make us strong, then nothing in this world can ever break us. Y'all hold on to God. No, I can't break it. I can't. Just like nobody can break God's love for us.
Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together here tonight to meet and carry on our city's business. Even politics here begins with a prayer. The city council is where people confront local government face to face on the issues that really matter, zoning, sewage, and taxes. There's a new industry in town since I was here, a lignite plant. But the old faithful is still around, timber from the piney woods by the yard. And some people practice an ancient craft. They will tell you here that a third of the flower pots manufactured in America come from Marshall. Marshall is a town where rich and poor still live not very far from each other. And we even have suburbs. There weren't any when I was growing up. Now you find them scattered all through these pines. On down the road where folks used to plant cotton and grow vegetables, they raise cattle. You remember this around here. Cows have the right of way on a road like this. An auction is still almost as much fun as scaring your old maid aunt with a rubber snake. I don't remember the name of the kid we dared to blindfold a heifer in her pen at the East Texas State Fair one year, but he lost. This is a Texas town. Look at the faces. You see it on the street signs as well. Texas heroes share equal billing with the nation's founders. This is where I grew up, on the street named for the father of Texas, Stephen F. Austin. The elementary school I went to down there was named for Sam Houston, the first president of the Republic of Texas. Sam Houston came to Marshall once to make a speech. The old oak tree is still there, duly noted as a kind of well, for some of us, a kind of shrine. When I walked to town, I crossed Alamo Boulevard and came back on Bowie or Crockett Street. Now, I'm sure you remember that Jim Bowie had to borrow money to make it to the Alamo in time to die by the side of Davy Crockett. This was a Texas town, but it was also a southern town. I remember the night air filled with tall tales and the fragrance of magnolia blossoms. A town's past and place make it different from every other town, no matter how much they all may seem alike. And we're really not that far from our past. The town you see in Marshall today is a new town perched on the memories of one that's gone. For a boy growing up beside these railroad tracks, Marshall was the crossroads of the world. I still remember the Sunday my mother and I came down to wave to my uncle, who was passing through on one of the countless troop trains that rolled through Marshall all during the war, shuttling boys hardly old enough to shave to places they'd never heard of, places like Normandy and Sicily and Iwo Jima. For most of this century, the Texas and Pacific Railroad was Marshall's principal industry. The shops hummed with activity, repairing old cars and building new ones. Then, the humming stopped. Except for these freight trains that are still doing some work here, this is a ghost yard now. There are a good many opinions on what happened. Of course, the general decline of railroad transport was the main feature. Hobart Another Key's family started banking here way back in the last century. There was a time when they made the entire payroll for the Texas and Pacific Railroad with silver dollars because people didn't trust paper money. Hobart Key has lived all his life in Marshall. Nevertheless, they moved the major part of the operation to Fort Worth. And uh, they began to phase this yard down gradually. When I was a boy in the 40s, Mr. Key, I used to come down here and imagine, where are these trains going? I'd try to see the cities oh, yes. to which they were destined. I know what you mean. <laughs> and we all wanted to go, you know. Yes. That was the thing. There'd be the down train from St. Louis would have a division that would go on from here to New Orleans. Another uh, sleeper would, uh, or a couple of them would cut out and go to Houston. And the rest of them would go on to El Paso and so on. Dallas, Fort Worth, they always said Fort Worth. 
El Paso, Los Angeles, you know, all those places we dreamed of going. Of course, it was against the rules of the railroad to take the boy in the cab and let him ride in the engine, but I had some friends. Every boy had a friend down here. He'd come out while they were putting water in the tender and kind of sneak aboard, and your friend wouldn't run you off. And the next thing you knew, there you were, riding in the cab of an engine, which was every boy's ambition. Everybody that wanted, was, everybody wanted to be an engineer. From then on, there, once you'd been in the cab of an engine, and especially a passenger train, they called those the varnish because they were, they were varnished coaches, you know. <laughs> and you were riding in an engine that was pulling the varnish. And uh, right then, from there on, the rest of your life was downhill. You'd <laughs> done everything, see? <laughs> Oh, this isn't as easy as it looks. No, it's it. not. Whoa. I got a few years on you, and I'm having trouble. <laughs> oh. This was a good place to grow up, wasn't it? Oh, it was the best in the world, I thought. This railroad here, of course, was the beginning of adventure for all of them. This was sort of a Tom Sawyer sort of a place. We didn't envy Tom Sawyer or Huckleberry Finn their mighty Mississippi. We had Caddo Lake. 32,000 acres of winding bows teeming with moss and old memories. Legend says it was formed in the dark of the moon by shaking earth spirits angry with the chief of the Caddo tribe. Some folks claim it was just a plain old earthquake. Maybe. This was the destination for paddle wheelers coming up to Texas from New Orleans, chugging into the Big Cypress Bayou with settlers, merchants, and fortune hunters. Sixty people died in 1869 when the steamboat Mitty Stevens burned near Swanson's Landing. We used to camp down here as kids, and we could hear their ghosts gliding through the lily pads, moaning in the morning mists while the bullfrogs croaked in escort. If you hang around here long enough, you hear all the old stories or start making up your own. Most of them begin, listen now, I've got a good one for you. There was this old boy. We called it Paul's Lake. So when he died, I figured it belonged to me. How and it might. There's been some wondering about who owns Caddo Lake. There's been a person or two accused me of owning it. And I guess I have as much or more claim on it as anybody. White Moore is almost as old as the century. There's not much he can't tell you about Caddo Lake. He's been poking through these mossy waterways so long, he's a legend himself. There's not a fish in these parts that he hasn't caught twice, or a ghost he doesn't know by its first name, or a tale he's left untold. Born in year one of this century, you spent your whole life in these bowels among these cypress trees. Well, up till now, I'm not through yet. I'm waiting for Halley's Comet, and then I hear tell they saw it coming the other day, just a billion miles away. Well, you've got some time <laughs> waiting for that. I promised my grandchildren that I'm going to show them Halley's Comet. I saw it when it passed before. Yeah, don't many people get to see it go by twice. You've lived through the whole century. How do you account for it? Well, back when I was younger, I noticed people that died at home in the bed. Didn't have hospitals in much of those days. They died at home in the bed, so I stayed away from home and out of the bed just as much as possible. <laughs> then on up in the years, when I begun to get ready to retire, I got to reading the actuaries of the insurance companies, and you die at 67 after you retire. Well, I watched that year when I was 67, and I was real careful all that year, and after that was over, I went to getting reckless again. <laughs> Catch fish better last winter than you could this summer. How come? I don't know. They changed their habits. I used to use a system make them jump in the boat. <laughs> yeah. I caught my first fish in Caddo Lake when I was about eight or nine years old. And that's the only fish I've ever really cared about. But more important to me than the fish was 
the fact that these cypress trees represented a thousand different characters, ghosts, phantoms, creatures, giants. Uh, it does something to your imagination down here. Well, it's kind of eerie, especially on a moonlight night. There's uh, almost any kind of wildlife around here, fish life and other wildlife, uh, most any kind of varmint. There's a good many deer, possum, coons, and got to be a lot of beavers here lately. We didn't have beavers. Any alligators in alligator bowels? Yes, I see one every year or so, and I could see more if I'd try. You can see them at night. The big lake gets rough with waves and water, and you can't be on it in a small boat. I have been in two drownings, where some of us drowned and some of us didn't. And, How'd you uh, get out? Well, I stayed on a stump eight hours once, from mid midday to just about dark. Well, in these 81 years you've lived here, we've had world wars, and nuclear bombs, and cold wars, and uh, civil rights riots, and changes in America. Things haven't changed too much down here, have they? People haven't changed. Same people are same people. There's two kinds of people on Earth the parasites and the producers. You were always a producer? Until the last two or three years. The government's just about made a parasite out of it. <laughs> White was an old man we used to uh, cultivate beginning the junior year in high school long because uh, he made this peculiar white stuff uh, as clear as this glass of water called moonshine. And one of his outlets when I was a junior in high school was... Uh, Joe Golden, one of my high school classmates. Here on the loop. And one night of a friend and I bought a uh, pint of moonshine, and the guy sold it to us. Said, to, "Now to really get the full impact of this stuff, you should go uh, cut it with a Dairy Queen milkshake." <laughs> and we nodded and bought a couple of Dairy Queen milkshakes. And went out to Scout Lake and mixed up a Dairy Queen milkshake moonshine cocktail. And about an hour later, I wished Jesus would have come and taken me home. I was so sick that we laid on the ground and just rolled around and hollered and wailed. And uh, I've never been able to drink moonshine since. There's quite a moonshine industry here. Uh, I somewhat became implicated in it for about 20 years. Somewhat? Well, I lived down on the lower part of the lake and had me a kind of a domain of my own down there. The main headquarters was around uncertain, but I wasn't in the union. I was kind of independent-like, and when they caught all of them, nearly, I was the only one that got left out. <laughs> They slighted me. I went to Jefferson once and watched about 15 of them being marched off to the Federal Correctional School. I felt awful lonesome for three or four months, but they all got back and started again. <laughs> lonesome but not regretful? No. <laughs> Weren't you constable once? Well, yeah, they had a constable here that had done things. Well, we didn't want a constable that had done anything, so... Uh, I was prevailed upon, put a name on ticket, and was overwhelmed and elected. And I stayed constable almost all the term. Finally, I resigned. But while I was constable, I was accused of being constable and one of the most respected moonshiners in the area all at the same time. We would give the sheriff fish to kind of keep him sued off, and we'd give the game warden whiskey. It wasn't, we didn't feel it was ethical to give the sheriff whiskey in the game warden fish. <laughs> he used to run the liquor control board crazy over here because he knew that lake. And they couldn't find him. Uh, an LCB agent told me one time they chased a man for 45 miles and uh, never leave uh, you know, a mild area of the lake. <laughs> and that got the idea that uh, Wyatt was just had the ability to disappear or become a uh, blue heron and fly off. Yeah, the rumor was that he, he, he drank a, a pint of his own homemade stuff and, and became invisible. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever yearn for the good old days? Well, I think about them some, and I enjoyed them while, they were, while I was there and young and able to stand them. I don't think I could stand the good old days now. I was 38 years old before I lived where there's electric power. We chopped wood and burnt wood and caught worms and eat them and caught fish and eat them and kind of lived off the land and other people weren't that fortunate in towns and places, I guess. But the good old days may have toughened me up to make me last to where I am now or even longer, I hope. I'm waiting for Halley's Comet, then I'll set me another goal. 
You didn't have to read about characters like Wyatt Moore in a book. They were part of your everyday experience here. So were older people who might otherwise have been remote figures of authority. Even as a kid, you could have an easy and natural relationship with them. My first grade teacher lived just down the block from me, Mary Simpson. I remember from the time I was knee high to a grasshopper until she died a few years ago. And Miss Collins, my third grade teacher, lived just behind her. And a block over lived Bella Wyatt, the principal of the elementary school I attended. In class, they commanded the heights and you knew your place below. But on Saturdays, they were just plain folks, your neighbors. Miss Simpson would be raking the leaves on a Saturday morning and she'd stop to speculate with you about why the mockingbirds were so noisy this morning. Or she'd ask about your brother who was in the Navy. You weren't just a kid fumbling in the multiplication tables for the right answer. You were somebody. By the world's reckoning, your father might be just an ordinary man, as my father was. But he was somebody, too. Everybody knew who he was, and everybody knew whose boy you were. Nathan Goldberg had a shop right here. And one Saturday afternoon, when I was about 12 years old, I was walking home, twirling through the air one of those round pieces of cardboard that come out of a hat box. Well, the wind caught it and sailed it right into Nathan Goldberg's neon sign. And that sign shattered all over the sidewalk. Mr. Goldberg came out. I'd never been in his shop before, but he said, Billy Don, your father's going to have to make good on that sign. Now, Mr. Goldberg could have called the police. He could have grabbed me by the scruff of the neck. He could have cursed me, but he didn't. He called my father because he knew my father. That familiarity was the best kind of safety net a kid could have. Oh yes, my father made good on that sign. It cost him one fourth his weekly paycheck. Every small town has its favorite meeting ground. This was ours, still is, Neely's Brown Pig Barbecue. The Neely's started making what is undoubtedly the world's best barbecue sandwich back in the 20s. Kept going even when all five of the Neely boys were drafted during World War II. That's the family in the early days. Young James Neely is standing in front of the goat. Yes, so good to see you, Mr. Moyer. Sure glad you to have you down here. James and his wife Frances run the place now. They still use the same ingredients as ever. A soft bun, plenty of pork, shredded lettuce, and a sauce that remains a closely guarded family secret. Pork lovers from as far away as Niagara Falls, New York, will drive back here just to savor a brown pig. Friday or Saturday night in Marshall, if you uh, miss an appointment with somebody, one of your friends, you could just drive around here. Eventually, yeah. you'd find them. Yeah. Eventually, Somewhere everybody hit this place one time or another. But I think it kept us a lot out of trouble. We uh, will use this as this is the hangout. This yeah. is really the club. I mean, this to me is better than the Metropolitan Club in Washington. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been there, but I think it's better. Can you, what you tell us something else? What were the good things about growing up in Marshall? A sense of belonging. When you walk down the street, you know who you were. And also the sense you could have good friends. I come back here now and I uh, can pick up conversations with people I hadn't seen in 20 years, as if it's only yesterday. We have a Joe Golden. When I knew him in high school, he was called J.C. He left Marshall to become a big city reporter and successful writer, the author of a dozen books, and lives now in Washington, D.C. For years, Joe's father ran the only bookstore in town. His mother still lives here. The TMP Railroad's going north. They had two minor viaducts there. During the war years, we'd play gorilla on there. We'd have a TNP train come by, and we would uh, be rushing gorillas. We'd ambush it and uh, scare the hell out of the brakemen. They don't know what these little kids are doing, throwing <laughs> grenades, which are tomato cans filled with mud at them. I guess they thought it was just cheap vandalism, but we were out, you know, uh, stopping the uh, uh, Nazi army. You said that it was, you had a sense of belonging when you walked down the street. What do you mean? You could walk six blocks and you'd have 30 people speak to you, the people in the stores. Uh, those days, the men who were the merchants would uh, a lot of times stand in front of the store late in the afternoon. And you'd know uh, Mr. Bradbury, you know Mr. Granger, you'd know Mr. Hanson, uh, Mr. Powers. And they would say hello to you or uh, rub the back of your head or something. You'd run into Millard Cope, you'd run into Joe Hirsch, you'd run into... Exactly, people. Max Lale. Uh, it was a very comforting thing because the people around uh, were your own folk. Lyndon used to say it that uh, they knew when you were sick and cared when you died. I still felt it very keenly. My father died in 1972 uh, in a hospital over at Shreveport, 40 miles away. And by the time I got to the house, an hour later, this house was full of uh, covered dishes, pies, fruits that uh, neighbors and church people had brought in. 
it's a customary in the South when somebody dies for everybody to chip in and help the family because they know they're gonna have, you know, uh, a lot of out of town company. We had enough food in that house to feed half a Marshall. What was the other side of growing up here? What was the, the price of growing up in a small town? Feeling frustrated that uh, you were locked into a certain role here. I knew that uh, the highway went east, the highway went west, and uh, there's not much happened on this particular spot that was Marshall. That you were born into a uh, certain role in this town, and uh, unfortunately, there was darn little upward mobility in those days. Uh, the banks were run by the same families. There was one employer, the TNV Railroad. Uh, there was one newspaper whose publisher had a son who was essentially my age. I knew there was no future there. And the best job offer locally uh, I ever had I was a uh, stock manager at the local Piggly Wiggly store, a chain grocery. And one night at 11 o'clock, I was doing inventory, no overtime. I was working 70 hours a week for $35. And the uh, manager said, don't go down to the University of Texas. You're going you're to be out of place there. If you'll stay with Piggly Wiggly, We'll make you produce manager in the Henderson, Texas store at 35, $37.50 a week and give me two fifty raise. I looked at J.B. Cannon, who was maybe 50 years old with a broken back and broken arches and uh, tired and worn out. I didn't want to be like that uh, 30 years down the road. So uh, as fast as I got, I could get out of here, I ran to the University of Texas at full speed. What gave you the idea you could get out? Books. My father was a reader. He was a very introverted man. He uh, had few friends. He knew very few people well in this town, but he read a lot. And I was exposed to books at a very early age. He told me to read, for instance, when I was three years old. And I went through the Marshall Public Library. I went through that thing by the time I was in the, finished the third grade. And Lord, I was lost. And nothing else to read. And in those days, uh, you didn't have the cheap paperbacks, and I didn't have any money anyway. And through luck, I discovered something that I think few in our generation knew about, the Carnegie Library out at Wiley College. The Black College. The Black College. And I found out about it and went out and introduced myself to the woman who ran it. And she said, you know, uh, uh, white people just don't use this library. I said, well, I'd really like to get in your books and look at them. She said, okay, just do me a favor, though. I don't want to get in any trouble with the white folks in this town. Would you mind coming in around the back to the basement? And occasionally a uh, contemporary would find out what I was doing, see where the books were marked, uh, Wiley College Library. I said, boy, what you doing reading those nigger books? I said, oh, they're interesting. But uh, I saw the books as a way out. I used to read a lot of adventure stories. Uh, and then I fell into uh, books about journalism. And I had the idea that to be a city reporter for the Dallas Morning News and to cover such exciting things as Dallas politics, God, that would be wonderful. But this world I'd never known about unless it was for books. And for Bella White. And for Bella White and, and father. for my father. And then for someone who taught me a bit about writing, someone whom I think we share a common experience. Uh, the Bear Bryant of Senior English, uh, Selma Brutzi, <laughs> who could uh, cow somebody five times her size. The classes I taught in the high school were composed of exceptional children. We thought so. <laughs> I thought so, and I thanked my Heavenly Father for it. Yeah, I was talking to someone last night who said uh, he would get up a three-day mad about her. He would be ready to you know, kill her. But God, I loved her. And I, at the time, at the same time, I'd love her, but at the same time, I could wring her neck. But you came out of there and you knew what the written word was all about. And if uh, you were one of the people she considered uh, that had a, a, a touch of talent, she wouldn't let you do second-rate work. And what was this? This was the place where this was the post. What do you call Hitching it? Post. Hitching post. Hitching post. And there was a round ring that went up here where the people put the reins. Do you remember the horses the horse. being hitched here? Yes, yes. yes. Selma and Emma May Brotzi are retired after lifetimes of teaching yes. in the Marshall Public Schools. And when I was under their spell, Miss Emma May was principal of the junior high school, and Miss Selma taught senior English and journalism. You taught how many years, Miss Selma? Oh, my land, don't ask me that. Forever. Since and the creation of until... I mine, 47. 47 years. I was eight, both, I of us were eight, both of us were 18 years old when I we started 49. teaching. You taught 49 years? And you but taught. I started, we were old, we, we were not were dry behind the ears when we started. We were reared in a home where learning was important and reading was important books, we were we brought up to read and to love reading and i don't remember a time in my life bill when i did not want to be a teacher we had a neighborhood of children uh, whose names you would recognize that after school every afternoon we went to a vacant lot on west rusk street and played school every afternoon and I never did know anything other than I wanted to teach. 
And you told me that you kept your head where all of your youth? Down in a book. I was all the time reading. I, I didn't do a whole lot of things. Some of the rest of them did because I preferred reading. She didn't go out trick-or-treating on Halloween. No, I didn't do that, and I didn't ride in a wagon down to uh, that place you and the horse. It horse wasn't horse a wagon. Ran. It was a horse and buggy. Yeah, yeah. To well, a cemetery right. where I, I just didn't like the, the, the whole lot of things I didn't care to do. I'd rather have been at home reading a good book. Miss Hummer, but, I remember uh, that, that my interest in poetry, in language, in the word began with your reading aloud in class, um, Shelley and Byron. I, I never ask any student to read a poem. I read the poem to them. Why was that? Because I knew I could do a better job than they, and I, I wanted them to have something that would make an impression on them. You could uh, them. The people in the class wouldn't listen to one of their classmates reading a poem, but they listened to me. Mm -hmm. I will tell you this, and this you will find hard to believe, too. One child, when I got through teaching some of Shelley, came and asked me where she could order the complete works of Shelley. Poetry, if you please. And another one had the same feeling about Lord Byron. And those two got complete works of those poets. But I always read to them poetry. I remember. I can see you right I now standing there. I never asked them to read And I can see poetry. you standing in the middle of the, of the uh, oh. uh, corridor uh, acting as a as a diligent traffic control <laughs> officer. And I can see Bill Moyers <laughs> coming down the hall with books under his arms and looking straight ahead with an intent expression on his face and then going into the library to take his perch as a library assistant. And I thought, that boy has more self-confidence than anyone I've ever seen. It's really because I feared what Miss Selma would do to me if I didn't go <laughs> in and greet it. Tell me about your most vivid recollection of growing up at Marshall. The games the children played, how free and happy and uninhibited children were. What kind of games? Made up out of their own minds, out of their own experiences. You see, Bill, today, play is directed by a supervisor. Even a town the size of Marshall must have a play director. <laughs> there must be parks for children to play in. The park we played in was a vacant lot across the street, thick with willow trees. Not tall, but just tall enough for our mothers to give us sheets to go and throw over the tops and that is how we made our playhouses, see? And we played all kinds of games in there, here, out of our head. We made them up. We just lived under the sheets there over the willow tree. You had to make your own play. We made our own play. We uh, imagined things. Some of it, of course, we got out of books ideas. We got out of movies ideas. But we did that, and then we would dramatize certain plays. We'd all get together. And I would be Jack Standfast. <laughs> <laughs> and Emma May would be? No. <laughs> you would be. I would be the drunk, the town drunk, <laughs> or the thief, or the robber. Anything that, that was right. degrading, <laughs> she, that was her opportunity to get even with me because she claims I knocked out her first tooth. <laughs> <laughs> and that wasn't the game we played either. That is a truth. I don't about even remember it. But I do because I was the victim. <laughs> what else did people do for fun? No, we had. I uh, don't know movies. We went to just movies, the movies sometimes. What kind of movies? Oh, one real movies. And we would all go together. Daddy, my mother, and the three children. There would be five, see, in that family, and we, it would cost us exactly 50 cents for the whole caboodle. Ten cents. Everybody get, got in. And the way we knew what was going to be, uh, was it Friday or Saturday night? Saturday. On Saturday night. We would just wait breathlessly on Saturday for the streetcar. No, it would be on Friday, a day ahead of time, to Tonight. come along because there would be a big sign on the back of the streetcar and it would say, six reels tonight, nuff, N-U-F, sad, S-E-D. But you left out the important thing, six, six reels tonight, 10 cents. I was getting to that presently. Nuff said, nuff said. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I was going to get the... You say enough what, said. <laughs> what kind of it movies was, did you like? There are two classifications of movies in those days. One was called Shooting and Killing. The other was called Hugging and Kissing. <laughs> and my we father preferred the shooting and killing. And Selma and I preferred the hugging and kissing. <laughs> but having six reels, you had you some had of both. You had six doses of it, see? <laughs> this was a big event for the family. Oh, why, oh, it was, yes. The regularity of it never did become boring. That's the reason see? we ran down to the corner of West Houston to see if they were going to have six reels for 10 cents. Enough said. <laughs> Someone told me that people in this town live by the whistle of the train. Was that true? They did. <laughs> Don't they? I tell him the story. Tell him, but then, now, wait a minute. Not on the air. Oh, no, Is tell he going to take it? Wait a minute. If it uh, doesn't we'll, work, I'll, I'll, sure. I'll edit but it now, out. Listen, What's the story? Wait just a minute. Do you hereby swear that you will not use it because this is a it's, lovely lady? Well, it's, well, I vow that I won't use name. it unless it's a good enough story that it, I need to use it. You will need to use it, and you do not have to use the don't, name. Don't tell I'm me not going to give you the yeah, name. Well, well, you don't tell me the name. Is she dead now? She's yes, dead. Yes, she's okay, dead. She's dead. But that <laughs> doesn't mean you don't have to have the name. She lived on East Austin, <laughs> and she taught in the East End School. You would know her. I went to that school. Yes, you, you would have known, but don't tell you. him the name. I will tell you later. You may figure out. She uh, lived on East Austin Street, and for some reason she had to, probably she had important home chores which she had to perform before going to school. So her alarm clock was the five o'clock whistle from the TP shops. Everybody sat there. You knew when five o'clock in the evening came because the whistle blew. You knew when noon, when noon came because of the whistle. You knew that it was time to get up if you were an early riser because of the whistle. The morning after, her first morning after she retired, the whistle blew and <laughs> she jumped out of bed and uh, started to get dressed and all of a sudden she realized that the whistle no longer meant anything to her. So in her <laughs> nightgown, she opened the front door and stood on the porch and thumbed her nose at the whistle, at the, at the whistle. At the TNP train? The TNP whistle. <laughs> and that's all there is to the story. No, no, one, made would, it it is, is, no one would suspect that this lady would do anything like she, that, you know. I Just would doing suspect like that, I would you suspect know. it of her. <laughs> You knew her. Yes. <laughs> she, was she was very prominent in the Baptist church. She had charge of many things up there. And she really and truly was a very lovely person. Was that Miss Bessie Bryant? Oh! <laughs> <laughs> you guessed who he is. <laughs> Bill, don't put it in the story. He, I she, think was she was a good lady. She was a good lady. When she she really got it Baptist going church. well. She lived there, way down there near the school. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Emma May, do you remember Saturdays on the Square? Oh, yes. Not only on the Square, but all through town, every Saturday night was the biggest event for the townspeople because every store was open. It was hard to make one's way through certain portions of the town because Saturday was a go-to-town day. Farmers had come in there literally with wagons, horse-drawn wagons of produce and watermelon, corn, tomatoes. And the people would go do their shopping on the west side of the square there. And then you had uh, the, the mercantile stores around and until the Second World War. The square was very sharply divided. Blacks simply did not come on the east side of the square. They were pretty much all uh, told not to, and they'd get knocked off the sidewalk. They shopped on the, on the west side of the square. Now, a lot of the uh, cheaper department stores were on the west side of the square, and uh, you as a white could go buy something there. But a, a black didn't dare go on the other side. Now, that changed during the war. But the square has always been something. My mother, who is now in her 70s, uh, used to make her first trips to town in a horse-drawn wagon from Elysian Fields, which is about 12 miles uh, south of here. They get up at 3 in the morning and uh, they put the kids in the back of the wagon with the produce, and they give them a blanket, and they go to sleep, and they wake up at sunrise when they came to Marshall. And all the farmers in Harrison County would be there. And now uh, they would sell their produce and buy the kid uh, some candy and do their grocery shopping for the week, and then at 3 in the afternoon load up and go home. There was one thing about going to town on Saturdays, which I feared, whether it was particularly during the daytime, and that was passing a saloon. There was a fear in my heart about going by a saloon and seeing a, seeing a man staggering on the streets and knowing 
what had caused it. Well, with that, well the with town the... that you see at that time, Bill, the town was what we call wet, mm -hmm. open saloons. And there were groups of women who got together, and men also, but primarily women, who determined that they would do something to have Marshall go dry. We all marched in white dresses carrying a white flag. Our mother made our white flag by tearing up a sheet. Before the national movement, oh, it was yeah, somewhere oh, around yeah. 1910 oh, or 12. Yes. And everybody went through town singing this song. I don't know if I could sing it or not. Try right. <laughs> I can't sing, but I will sing it anyway. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Marshall's going dry. <laughs> the town went dry, and everybody was hilariously happy. How do you count then for Marshall came, being ahead of the national movement? Because we were a very, uh, Marshall has been a very uh, tightly structured town, I think. The people, they have cohesive is a better word. And any anything which would be for the betterment of the town, everybody rallied around it. There's, of course, I've never lived anywhere except in Marshall, but there has been a cohesiveness about the town. I wish I was in the land of cotton. Shared values of membership in small town life gave the people here that cohesion they still talk of. But it also came from the past, the particular past of the Old South. Before the Civil War, East Texas was settled by small farmers and large plantation owners who left the southern states looking for land where they could start over. With them, they brought the economy and values of the slave system, and they fought to keep it. During the Civil War, Marshall became the seat of civil authority for the Confederacy west of the Mississippi, and the loyalties continued to a cause that was lost but not forgotten. And this is the old Marshall Cemetery. It's been here since the city started in about 1842. Now here is General Lane. He uh, had a rather remarkable career. Fought in the Battle of San Jacinto in about a half a dozen Indian wars. He uh, volunteered as a sutler and went to West Texas and fought Indians. Then uh, he came back and uh, became a major general in the Civil War. For the Confederacy. For the Confederacy. And raised a regiment here and then went on with them, fought Pleasant Hill. In fact, we have about three or four Confederate generals buried in this cemetery. Most of them were living when I was a young man. My grandfather, uh, my mother's father, was a captain in the Georgia Infantry. And, of course, I heard a lot about that end of the war and about General Sherman. Marshall was the Richmond of the Confederacy west of the Mississippi. Unspeakable profanity though it be, aren't there some Yankee soldiers buried here? Well, yes, now that you mentioned it, uh, <laughs> we, wouldn't we'll to get around to you that. You wouldn't go to mention it. Uh, there are a few here. You see that monument way over in the corner? Off to itself. Off to itself where uh, they won't be bothered by us and we're not bothered by them. That largest monument is to the Yankee soldiers who died here in the prison camp. So it was really impossible, wasn't it, mm -hmm. to have been a young man here, to be a boy, and not be aware of that powerful presence of the past? Always. And uh, you might say, uh, you could reach out and touch it because uh, you were going fishing every day with your grandpa who fought in that war. In Dixieland, I'll take my stand. Like other towns in East Texas, Marshall has its statue of Johnny Reb on the town square. You couldn't stand here without thinking about the Confederate cause. At the same time, above it was the eagle, representing America, Union. Washington and Jefferson and Sam Houston, too. The eagle was always greater than the statue, always above it. It was the stuff of ambition. It could make your heart beat. But it was troubling, too. 
What was it Johnny Reb had fought for? You knew there was something terribly wrong about it, but something you couldn't run from either. And you knew and loved people who could still shed a tear for the South, still weep for the lost cause. All of you have heard of Mimosa Hall, haven't you, down at Lee, Texas? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Do you recognize it here in the pictures? Yes, ma'am. That's right. There it is. Inez Hughes is 80 years old. She's descended from one of the first families to settle in these parts. She taught English in the high school for years, taught it to us unforgettably, and is now the curator of the museum in the old courthouse. Mimosa Hall was built in 1844, and the Blocker family have lived there ever since. And did you know that there they have a cemetery uh, part? Of, it's called the Webster Cemetery, and I call it Mimosa Hall Cemetery. And in it they have slaves. Now, all of this was cotton. I can remember those times. Douglas Blocker grew up at the cotton plantation known as Mimosa Hall. He remembers when cotton was still keen. When did cotton finally die out of East Texas? I think you can date it with World War II you know, before the war, cotton was number one. Now it's number 10. After the Civil War, most of the plantations were broken up and the land divided. But Mimosa Hall was kept intact and worked by tenant farmers. When I was growing up, it was still a picture of Southern elegance and hospitality. As teenagers, we would drive by, half expecting to see Rhett Butler striding up the stairs in his riding boots. Today, Douglas Blocker lives here with his mother, Ethel, who once managed her cotton with a watchful eye. There's 1,200 acres here, and there was about 12 tenants. I rode a mule, and show was a good saddle mule, too. So I rode my 1,200 acres twice a day to see that my tenants were tending to their business because you know they'll steal anything they can lay their hands on. I got my crop picking one day, because they all come. I paid them a set a pound for picking. I paid them a whole dollar for the one that picked the most cotton. <laughs> that, that's, that's the way I got my crop picked. That's my father, who uh, was almost 90 when he died. And in this 1976. Is, yes, and uh, in May, and Mardi Gras uh, departed this life about Christmas. Mardi Gras? Yes, his dog. Mardi Gras was a dog? Mardi Gras. And buried in this honored place beside your father. Well, she was here first, and when Sullivan's man came wanting to know Peter where Alvin. my yes where my father was to go i said next to money Gras. she and my mother's dog did not get along and so we weren't invited to the funeral now this quadrant was the slave ground because they were a family as you will see in a most touching way over here the from those days uh, the markers were not permanent and so uh, just as we have lost markers inside and do not know. Here we have Henry Clay, Joe Allen, and Lev Johnson. Now they These are all slaves? Yes, they were the slaves, although their lives took them elsewhere after independence. Oh, they were not associated with the family in a business sort of way, but this was their family in a sense which we cannot understand, and they were felt to be. These men, who had spent years after emancipation as free men, come back all those years later to be buried in the place where they had been slaves. Because they felt that this was their family and they were welcomed as family. That's hard for us to understand today, isn't it? Who can understand such a relationship? And yet, there it is. It's hard for people who might tell about Marshall to to, to believe that at one time Marshall owned more slaves. Harrison County had more slaves than any other county in Texas. In 1860, one man you know, Mr. Scott, uh, William uh, Thomas Scott, had over 500 slaves. What impact did that era of the Civil War, those old antebellum days, have on Marshall in the 20th century? Oh, every phase, every area felt the impact. 
religious, social, political, industrial, every phase of our culture felt the impact. For instance, in politics, uh, the Reconstruction period produced the Citizens' Party. In what year was that? 1876, right? That was the beginning of what we call our industrial expansion period. See, the railroad had come here in 73. The whites couldn't even vote. The Little Virginia Courthouse was here, and during the Reconstruction period, they had one entrance to it this way, and it was blocked off, roped off, and they, it took three days to vote, and the blacks completely flopped in and would not let the whites even get in to vote. This was so, the Reconstruction era. That's uh, in a blacks yes, excluding sure, whites. Well, the blacks, you know, the, all the officers were replaced by blacks. So the animosities kept building on both sides. Everyone practically in the county had had grandfathers or fathers who had fought in the Civil War, and they carried. I, in fact, my stepdaughter said she, who taught history, American history, and one of the towns in the county said I tried to teach the whole year I tried to teach American history without mentioning Lincoln's name and this was back <laughs> in the 1930s I was always struck by the fact that when Marshall men have gone off in this century to fight in at the Argonne to fight at Normandy to fight in Korea to fight in Vietnam it's the Confederate statue that's the memorial that is typical of this of this area the, down at Scottsville Cemetery, the Confederate Memorial. Over in the Marshall Cemetery, the Confederate Memorial. What do you think that did to our, our attitudes, our sense of ourself? I feel that we absorb something of the dedication those people had to a principle. That they were willing to die for it, fight for it and die for a principle of, of uh, individualism. And I'll tell you what Governor Clark's grandson, Hartzell Clark, who was president of the First National Bank across the way, when integration was brought in, 64, wasn't it? He said, well, today we lost the Civil War. And that was in 1964. Up to that time, we had won it. <laughs> today, it's hard to believe that only 20 years ago, a dozen years after I finished high school, did this officially cease to be two towns. We had existed so long in separate realities, half black, half white, separate schools, separate drinking fountains, separate lives. Deep down, you might know something was wrong, but you didn't want to admit it to yourself or share it with others. I remember as a kid about five or six years old, uh, living on the house that uh, ran alongside an alley that went down to the cotton gin and wagons, horse-drawn wagons with cotton would come by, and, you know, bowls would fall out, and we would grab it, my cousins and I, and we would make our own little cotton fields, as kids will do. And one day, a little black boy jumped off the wagon and decided to sit there and play with us while his, I guess his father took the load on down uh, to the gin. And one of my aunts came out of the front porch and said, little nigger boy, go on, you can't play here. He jumped up and ran, and I couldn't understand why, because uh, he was just like us. He was out in the dust having a good time. There was an old chap at Ludetta, East Marshall, who was the brother of one of my high school teachers, who called a bunch of us kids one day and showed us a big photograph he had of uh, five or six blacks hanging from a tree on the campus of what is now East Texas Baptist College, big oak trees up there. These were uh, people lynched around the turn of the century. And then he pulled out a piece of old dried rope with blood stain, uh, brown, he said, blood stains on it, and showed it to us and made us handle this as part of the lynch rope. I felt physically sick that people uh, I knew and I lived with could have done such a thing or their grandfathers could have done such a thing. I was physically ill. Stay with you a long time? I had nightmares about it several nights. And I knew uh, from then on, I was probably 11, 12 years old, there was a dark side of this town that uh, we didn't know about. Marshall, Texas, Marshall, Texas. There really were two worlds here. If you grew up in one, you didn't trespass the other, except superficially. That's the hardest thing to acknowledge or understand today that our history could have held such advantage over our moral imagination, that you could grow up so pleasantly in so small a place, well-churched, well-loved, well-taught, and not apprehend the reality of others. The radio station that signed off with Dixie instead of the Star Spangled Banner, you knew that wasn't right, but it was custom. Custom, something repeated over and over again until it became the way things are. Custom taught you to keep your distance, 
even if on a Wednesday evening you came down and sat outside this black church as I did and listened to the choir practice. We lived in the same small town, witnessed to the same faith, sang and prayed to the same God, and kept our distance, except for the music. I've been praying for such a long time, praying for some peace of mind. Here Wiley College Choir. When I was growing up, Marshall had two black colleges, Wiley and Bishop. Bishop has moved to Dallas, but Wiley remains. When change came to Marshall, students from Wiley and Bishop brought it. James Farmer. He was born in Marshall in 1922. I never knew him, but when I was a boy, he was a student at Wiley where his father taught. A native son returns home. It's just good to have Dr. Farmer here. Let's just welcome Dr. Farmer. He went on to found the Congress of Racial Equality, an important civil rights organization in its day. But his awakening came much. here in Marshall, Texas. I hope my young friends, my brothers and sisters of Wiley College, that you are a part of the tradition which has made this college great. I hope that you are aware of all that has gone before you and thus are conscious of the responsibility which you bear. In 1954, the Supreme Court has said, look a here, Mr. Jim Crow, it's time you were dead. <laughs> Hallelujah, I'm a traveling. Hallelujah, ain't it fine? Hallelujah, I'm a traveling down freedom's main line. Most of you are far too young, all of you indeed, to remember it. You uh, were not born in the early 1960s. You were not born at the time of the Freedom Rides. We rode into Jackson. And we were still singing. If you can't find me in the back of the bus, you can't find me nowhere. Oh, come on up to the front of the bus. I'll be riding up there. And we pulled into the terminal of Jackson. Then the white freedom riders would begin singing. If you can't find me in the front of the bus, you can't find me nowhere. Oh, come on back to the back of the bus. I'll be riding back there. <laughs> it was rocking all over. The jailers are running around. Stop that singing! Stop that singing! Cut out that singing! What was this neighborhood like when you lived here in the 30s? Well, this street, of course, was here, but it was not paved. It was uh, red clay, mud when it rained. This is my house. This is where I lived from age 13 to 18. I would go downtown uh, occasionally to make a few purchases. Uh, usually, I would go down to uh, see a movie in the movie house. I think it was the Paramount Theater in those days. Um, significantly, uh, blacks sat up in the balcony. We called it the buzzard's roost. And so when we walked downtown, we would go around to the side entrance and up those stairs and uh, see the movie. You weren't allowed in the front entrance? We were not allowed in the front entrance and not allowed to sit downstairs. I mean, what went through your mind on such an occasion as that? Or did anything? Yes, almost invariably. 
Uh, the students used to have discussions every night. Uh, we call them bull sessions then. Now they're called rap sessions. We would tell ourselves and each other in louder and louder terms how horrible segregation was and that something must be done about it. And we have to put an end to it. But that didn't go very deep because the very next afternoon, we would walk down to the Paramount Theater, go around to the side entrance, up those stairs, and sit in the buzzard's roost. Did this reality not beat the spirit down? What it did was to uh, uh, stimulate me to participate in a movement that would try to bring about change. Did you have any hope that that change might occur here in Marshall? Yes, I hoped it would occur all over the country. Um, I thought it would be difficult here in Marshall because it was a small town. And the two worlds, uh, the black world and the white world, which seemingly passed like ships in the night, uh, had such little contact. And Marshall seemed to me at that time to be a city that had a built-in resistance chain. People were quite comfortable. There was an etiquette. Everyone knew what he was supposed to say, how he was supposed to act and uh, uh, lived by it. When you say etiquette, describe it. An etiquette for white people, an etiquette for black people? Oh, yes, very much indeed. The fact that uh, black uh, was not to be called mister. Uh, he could be called anything else. He could be called reverend. He could be called doctor. He could be called, of course, boy or uncle, if he were old enough for that appellation. Uh, but not mister. That was taboo, because that would uh, uh, sort of symbolize an equality. Did anybody tell you this is wrong, this has to be changed, this is an affront to humanity? Of course. We had one professor, Professor Melvin B. Tolson, who was a professor of English, uh, coach of debate and director of dramatics. He subsequently, by the way, became a well-known black poet in almost any anthology of black American poetry includes works by Tolson. The intellectually bent students would uh, congregate at his home in the evenings, and there we would read his poetry and comment on it. When I in his classes, he taught everything. He compelled people to think. How well I remember one day, when I was a freshman in Tolson's class, he saw me walking across the campus a good distance away, and he yelled, Farmer! Farmer! I responded. He said, what are you reading these days? I told him that I was reading Tolstoy's War and Peace. He smiled and said, that is fine. I'm glad to know that at least you are reading the broth of knowledge, but why don't you eat the meat? <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, he meant I was reading fiction, though it is great fiction. He wanted me to read other things as well. Wasn't there an effort at that time to, to dismiss men of that? Well, he, he had a problem. Uh, um, a couple of years before I entered Wiley College, Tolson had been told to get out of town and to be out by sundown the next day. Um, Tolson's friends gathered at his home, and they were going to sit it out because he did not intend to leave. Uh, however, the president of the college, Dr. Dogen, uh, was a good friend of the, probably the most influential white in town, the banker. And he called Mr. Keyes the banker and explained the problem and says, Mr. Tolson is uh, our best teacher and we just can't get along without him. And he's been told now by some people in town that he'd better be out of town by sundown. I don't know what'll happen to Wiley College without Mr. Tolson. Well, uh, we understand that Mr. Keyes told uh, Dr. Dogan that he needn't worry about it, that he would take care of the matter. And he did, and Tolson remained. What was it like in Black Marshall for a teenager in those days? We uh, could not go into any restaurant downtown except the little lunch counters which existed in the black communities. But downtown, we could not eat at the lunch counter in any of the drug stores, any of the variety stores. We could not uh, go into any of the hotels. That was another world, a world which we knew existed, but thought about as little as we could, uh, because it was painful to think of the fact that we were told uh, 
you're not good enough to associate with other people. If we were shopping for um, objects such as clothing, we were waited on, but after the whites had been waited on in most cases. Um, and then we're not allowed to try on clothing. There were exceptions to that. Uh, Well-known persons in the community, such as the president of Wiley College, Dr. Dobin at the time, uh, Professor Pemberton, who was the principal of Central High School at the time, they and their families were known and, I'm sure, tried on clothing. Uh, but most of us did not. It made shopping rather difficult. Uh, we could go into the variety stores, the five and 10 cent stores, as they were then called, and make purchases at all counters except that one which was forbidden, the lunch counter. Did you decide here at Wiley College to challenge the system? Oh, yes. Yes, there's no question about it. I decided it out of my contact with Professor Tolson here, the campus radical, and um, the conflict within my own soul in opposing segregation with my words, but with my deeds uh, adapting to it, like going downtown to the movie theater, walking up those uh, side stairs and sitting in the balcony, the buzzards roost. CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, which I founded in 1942 in the city of Chicago, was stimulated to a great extent by that contradiction which I felt while I was here at Wiley. In 1960, when college students throughout the South were sitting in and marching, I cannot tell you how pleased I was when I picked up the New York Times one morning and saw that Wiley College students were a part of it. They too were marching. That's right. That made me weep. It brought me to tears. We are here for what is ours, what we deserve, and what is rightly American. We are American, and we will be Treat it as America. Spring 1960, protests against segregation sweep the South. The whites of Marshall, long accustomed to a docile population of blacks, are stunned when students from Wiley and Bishop College ask for service at all white lunch counters and refuse to leave when they're denied it. The students are arrested. 400 others gather on the courthouse square in sympathy. They're dispersed forcibly. Local police call in highway patrolmen and Texas Rangers. The students are charged with unlawful assembly. A friend of mine will look back one day and say, we were two worlds waiting for an event. This was it. The students ringed the courthouse and sang and prayed there and made their demands and they were hosed. And the students who returned to the campus, of course, returned wet. And there was one young ministerial student who said to me, oh, I, when I asked, what happened to you? What happened to you? He said, oh, Miss Jenkins, I'm wet, but I'm happy. Inez Jenkins is now associate professor of religion and philosophy at Wiley College. The students had come of age. The black youth had come of age. And as I've often said, I felt that the time had come and they were just open, you know, to... The time had come. What do you yes. mean by that? Blacks had had uh, about a hundred years of education. And if education has value, if, it, if it's a search for truth, if it brings enlightenment, uh, certainly uh, the students would be awakened, you know, to what this country is all about. I was dean of women at the time that our students were arrested here in the local jail and the two Texas Rangers delivered the subpoenas. Two and Texas Rangers two came Texas to arrest Rangers. them? Yes, and I'd never seen a Texas Ranger before. And they were tall, beautiful human beings, but yet a little bit frightening to me. And those guns, you know, on their hips and I like the what you see in the movies you know <laughs> and so um, <clears throat> and I had never been that close to a gun before believe it or not and uh, I offered them the courtesy of my office to have seats and as we talked together I also noted that they had not taken off their hats and I asked them to do so and they refused and so I told them about this wonderful story that I'd heard um, where President 
Teddy Roosevelt, uh, passed Booker T. Washington, who was then the president of Tuskegee Institute. And Mr. Washington tipped his hat to the president. And of course, the president returned the courtesy. And his wife asked him, why did he tip his hat to that Negro? <clears throat> and the president said, I could not afford to allow the, a black man to be more courteous than the president of the United States. And then I said to them, how much I admired um, their people, that all of them that I had met always rose to the level of their culture. And so the faces, if you don't mind my saying so, turned red, and the hats came off. Mm -hmm. And those two men shook hands with me. What about redeeming the town? Did it serve that purpose? Yes, indeed, because now Marshall has a black postmaster, and you have black clerks in the banks, uh, black saleswomen in the stores. So change has come to Marshall. There's been a black mayor, a county commissioner. The schools are integrated, and sports, of course. The Medical Association has even elected a black physician as president. His name is Izzy Lamoff. Perhaps it says something about the nature of a small town that, like the students of Wiley College who challenged the way things were, he too came here from someplace else. Who knows how long we might have hugged the past tightly if the world had only let us be. I couldn't even practice on the staff of the hospital for a whole 15 years. What happened to a a black person in Marshall who needed hospitalization. We, as black physicians, would call a white physician and ask him to please admit this patient to the hospital. And he would then take the case and treat the patient in the hospital. Then, after the patient got well or whatever and was ready for discharge, he would, uh, if he felt so inclined and felt, uh, you know, that maybe we might send him some more, he'd send the patient back. But he was free to keep the patient, and in some cases, they did. Mrs. Lamoth, you came from Washington, D.C. What was your impression when you arrived in Marshall? At first, I didn't notice it. But then, as I started to get out in the community, it hit. How? Little incidents being called by my first name, this type of thing. And it made me very angry. The one thing that I found that was quite common with those who had been here, those who come from Marshall, those blacks particularly, they all seemed to be subservient to the white community. There was never any uh, disagreement. There was disagreement while they were in their own group. I mean, they talk about all that went on, but when they got down in front of the white power structure, it was different. So uh, uh, there wasn't any concerted kind of an, uh, an effort to change situations at all. Your daughter was the first black child to be admitted to the Catholic school in Marshall. What happened when you took her? It's like George Wallace standing in the <laughs> doors of the University of Alabama. That's what it was like, really because uh, when we took her, the people were standing in the doors. Literally? Literally. They to keep there. her out? Yes. I walked with that child with such determination that they knew I did not intend to be stopped. The sun was shining beautifully, and I had an umbrella in my hand. And we intended to go to school that day, and we did. The people weren't very friendly. Nobody smiled, but we did go to school. Has all the scar tissue, the struggle, the pain been worth it? Oh, sure, doggone, yeah. We've seen so much change and so much happen. Good, until that that's left uh, is sort of like mopping up, really. Personally and individually, you are accepted. Not as a whole group of people. I don't think. Publicly, you're accepted because of the public accommodations. But privately, 
we still aren't. I'm not terribly bitter about that. And as I have told some of my white friends, I have lovely black friends. And they keep me very happy. So I can find contentment in that. Marshall, Texas, Marshall, Texas. It's not even a town anymore. It's an all-American city, and rightly proud of being so. But as we know from this century, the good things do not come to us singly. They arrive with a mixture. I was nurtured here and cherished the memories. When I knocked on the door, it opened. But the place that anchors one man can be another's prison. Changes feared by some set others free. The marshal I knew is remembrance only. The years have swept it away. The center is gone, and with it the sense of place that made small towns the focus of life at the turn of the century. But just as many people live here now as ever, it's their home too, and their realities mean as much to them as mine did to me. So I will be careful not to boast to my grandchildren about the good old days or explain away those that weren't. I will tell them, however, of the small town that once existed in America and for better or worse is no more. I'm Bill Moyers. This program has been brought to you by the people of Chevron, who have been helping to supply America's energy needs throughout the 20th century.